What's up? Hope you're doing super well today. I'm going to play a podcast for you. I want to watch this with you because this, I watched this the other day, is straight gold. Okay. This is Audrea Whittington. She's from Local Logic. She's interviewing James Dwiggins. He's the CEO of Next Home. And this guy has a lot of inside information in the industry about these lawsuits, what is going to happen. I mean, he, he gets very detailed in this podcast. So I just, I wanted to play it for you, give you my commentary along the way, if I feel like I need to speak up about anything. Um, but at the end of the day, the, the big punchline here is that he says without a doubt, okay, he is 100%, 110% convinced that MLS, that we're going to be in a world where they don't allow you to offer the buyer agent a commission in MLS. So let me know in the comments if you think that's going to come true or not. I read every single comment. So I appreciate you guys for showing all the support to the channel. Subscribe, like, all that good stuff. I'm going to put a link below for my 2024 business planning session next Friday. Let's dive in. But Okay, so the verdict is in. This is part two. Um, we want to talk about what's happening. Um, so first and foremost, we're going to try and educate everybody who isn't hundred percent sure, because I actually did promote this to folks who are outside the industry, um, who really want to learn, like, what does this mean? How does this affect me? Cause I think for the first time we have something happening in the industry that, uh, affects everybody, um, in a, in a real way. And there's been a lot of sort of mainstream press in the times and the post about this. So I am going to limit you to five minutes, but I would like a five minute, maybe two um description of exactly what is happening here with the lawsuits um and please feel free to wrap in the verdict but let's keep it at the facts um just so we set the table properly yeah so basically starting in 2019 there were uh multiple class action cases that well multiple suits that were that were filed that have gotten class action status um and these suits were brought to <laughs> these suits were brought by lawyers go figure what I mean by that is I don't think random sellers just came up with these ideas. I think lawyers were definitely mm -hmm. part of this process. But the crux of it is, is that sellers are claiming that um, that they were essentially uh, required to pay uh, the commission for buyer's agents. So the way that this has worked in our industry for a very long time is the seller's agent would sit down with the seller and say, I'm going to list your home for X. And part of the compensation is going to pay the buyer's agent because the buyer is likely going to be very strapped for cash to be able to afford a down payment and closing costs and all of these things. Now, right there, I would say that when I go to when I when I used to go to listing agreements, listing appointments all the time, you know, I would say, okay, it's you know five six percent whatever it is, and then the language with the buyer agent commission for me, and you can let me know how you guys handle this verbiage wise, but it was always, if there's a buyer agent involved, right? Therefore I'm telling my seller, you know, this is the commission, right? This is what I get regardless if there's a buyer agent or not. I think the problem with the narrative out there is that there's always, I haven't heard anybody talk about, except for myself, I haven't heard anybody talk about the the situation where there's not a buyer agent involved okay does that mean i get half of what i'm telling you here no i get all of it and so i think that's something that i've been trying to make really clear and and be very loud and vocal about is that this is what you agree to regardless if there's a buyer agent involved or not the way that james just framed it was that get a list of appointments and say hey here's my commission here's how much is going to go to the buyer agent it's like that's how much is going to go to the buyer agent if there's a buyer agent involved, right? And it comes out of what you've agreed to pay me, regardless if there's a buyer agent or not. Anyway, I just want to make that extremely clear here. Um, and this is part of the problem for me with this entire thing is that the seller, you know, was paying the listing agent the five or six percent, regardless if there's a buyer agent involved or not. Would you rather them not be a buyer agent involved and pay me the full five percent? It's like we can't win for losing, you know. It sold in two days. You made, you know, fifteen thousand dollars. Do you want it to take sixty days? Would that make you feel better about how much I'm making? I'm trying to get you your money as quick as possible based on the deal that that we agreed to and you signed the paperwork of. It's insane. This whole thing is nuts to me. 
but uh, let's carry on. They're going to have representation. And in order to make sure that we have a, a transaction that doesn't end up with a bunch of problems, uh, you know, we're, it's, it's happened this way, you're, gonna, you're going to pay compensation. The reason for that also is just to attract, bring people to the table, et cetera. So it's been this way for a very, very long time. And um, essentially, these cases came together. I'm really summarizing here for two minutes, but I got a class together and said that, you know, we didn't know it was that way. We didn't, we didn't understand what we were signing in the, in the listing agreement that there's this collusion going on in the industry between the National Association of Realtors and the four key defendants to prop up compensation based upon three things, and then I'll be done. The National Association governs the oversight of majority of MLSs in the United States. The MLS has a rule in place where when you put a listing in the MLS, you have to offer, um, uh, provide a, a, an offer of compensation on the other side. That can be a dollar for clarity. Um, and then when the CCP rule was enacted by NAR, which is the clear cooperation policy, which basically states that when you are a member of the MLS, you have to put a listing in the MLS within 24 hours. What the plaintiffs are using is that these, all these different things were benefiting organized real estate, because if NAR governs it, you have to provide an offer of compensation on the other side of the deal, which is likely an agent, obviously, that's part of one of these big companies to some percentage, and then CCP requiring you to put listings in the MLS, you're thereby guaranteeing compensation. They're claiming you prop up uh, commissions in the marketplace. And so they brought these cases forward. There are three of them, no select out on the East Coast. There's Morrell out in Chicago, the Illinois area, which is in 20 markets. That's where it's based. And then Burnett, which is what this just went to trial, which is where we just lost. Uh, and the verdict of $1.78 billion. The jury basically gave everything the plaintiffs were looking for. The deliberation lasted under three hours. And because it's an antitrust claim in federal court, they have the ability, the judge has the ability to do treble damages three times the amount. So roughly $5.3 billion is the potential damage amount from the case. Damn, I'm good. I did that in two All minutes. right. I know. You rock. And you know what I realized? I didn't even introduce you, except that I make most people know who you are. James Doing this is the CEO of Next Home, one of the largest franchises in the country, uh, among other things. And somebody asked me, like, why James on talking about this? And I gave you my answer a few minutes ago, and I'm happy to give it. But, you know, what you are speaking a lot on this. Um, so I want to take one minute on sort of you know, how you think this is kind of how you become kind of a spokesperson, if you'll forgive me, I know you're you're agnostic, but a spokesperson on this issue. Well, first is in college, I did a few years of business and criminal law. So I've always had a interest <laughs> in the legal system, I should say, as a background. Number two is when these cases were filed. When I read through them, a friend of mine named Rob Hahn, who is a former uh, lawyer, was like, these are really serious things you should take a look at. And he started writing about him. A lot of people ignored him. But as I started to read through it and looking at his arguments, um, I was like, wow, this is actually a serious problem. Um, and if you take all of the pieces that plaintiff has laid out, which I kind of summarized very quickly, they they had some pretty strong grounds for a conspiracy claim on essentially you know, how we prop up compensation. I don't agree with it for clarity. I do not agree with it. They just took a lot of things that have been placed that have been put in place over time for different reasons and then mapped out this, this. case. And needless to say, you know, they uh, convinced the jury, which I figured would happen. It, to well, me, of this course, is, it's a jury trial and everybody's bought a home. Right. So you're going well, to be hard pressed. To be clear, the, all of the jurors couldn't be, couldn't be part of the class. So I want to make sure that's clear. None of those jurors bought a house in that time frame. So there were stipulations to be, I, I'm with you. I'm just for clarity. <laughs> there are stipulations to be a juror in that. I don't disagree there's going to be bias because I love Americans. I'm one, but we're all greedy as shit. And needless to say, well, let me say it a little nicer. People vote their people vote their pocket their money. Right. Yes, yeah. they just do. Yeah. So the point is, I think these were very serious cases for a lot of reasons. I could spend hours explaining more of the details, but okay. it just was I was not surprised this verdict was going to happen. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure we'll dive into this, but there is a lot of things that are likely to change now in our business. Well, let's let's um and I'll and I'll tell you that the answer I gave to somebody was, look, I do think you you were ahead of the curve on this and kudos to Rob if that came from Rob originally. I'm not surprised, but um I think you've been really vocal about it and I think uh, it's much like picking uh, presidential elections or stock picks or a hedge fund manager. I think you've been ahead of the game 
Um, but to your point, and you and I've talked about, doesn't mean you'll be right moving forward. It just no. means that you've been insightful about what what's happening here. Uh, frankly, well before a lot of us, including me. Yeah. So let's talk about the the ramifications of the verdict, right? So the verdict is a lot of money. NARA doesn't have it. Let's face it. Um, you know, and there's potentially uh, a number of other suits that are on the heels of it, right? So it, it in, as with any antitrust case, it, it opens the door, right? Right. So um, I think we can ask, answer any questions later about that, but let's talk about does the, <laughs> there's three segments to this really, right? Does the industry understand the ramifications starting to panic to a million articles now? Does the consumer understand what's happening here? Not at all. Um, so let's break it into two segments here. Which would you rather tackle first? You choose. I'm going to choose the consumer because huh? God, that's the part that interests me candidly more is because I, and for the exact reason that you just pointed out, I am a consumer and I did sell my house in the last five years. So um, I have had more people, I will tell you, most people are like, I have no idea what you do for a living in my world, like my yeah. personal world. Yeah. And this is the first time I've had a number of friends come up to me and, and family and be like, what is this? What is the ramifications? What's happening here? How does it affect me? So mm. that's not happened before for me. Yeah. So basically, I'll, I'll start here. In the United States, we are somewhere between five to six million units short of housing in this country. This is an important stat I'm sharing with you. For those of you who own a house that's benefited you. Because when you have, you know, limited inventory, your prices go up. And we've seen basically prices of homes continue to skyrocket, not only through the pandemic, but even after that. And even during a time where interest rates are high, prices are fairly stable. And that's because of just simple supply and demand economics. Now, why I'm sharing that with you is the single greatest creator of wealth in this country is owning a house, period. End of story. It is the number one reason why people generate generational wealth in this country is through housing. Housing also accounts for about 20% of our GDP. What I mean by that is not just the sale of a house, it's the financing, it's Home Depot repairs, it's the contractor, it's everything that touches the sale of a property as about 20% of the gross domestic product in this country. So what we have unfortunately created in this country is massive wealth through real estate, but also something that is incredibly expensive to, to afford. It's also very complex. So in, for example, California, you know, it's not uncommon for disclosure packages based upon the laws and rules and regulations to be 100 to 200 pages deep. Everything you need to know about this property, every possible thing that could have yeah, gone wrong, right. et cetera. So it is not, this is the thing I think everybody has to understand. It is not a transaction that people do more than two to three times in their life. It is also the single largest transaction a majority of Americans, and when I say majority, overwhelming majority of Americans will ever do in their lifetime. So it's not something you Amazon, it's not something you artificial intelligence, it's something that's emotional. Well, if it was something you Amazon, it would be on Amazon. Okay, sure. And Amazon, <laughs> ironically, was thinking of getting the real estate space and then they got and out. Google, so, and actually Google got in and got out as well. Yeah. So it it is it is a very complex transaction where you're going to spend all of your money doing it. Now, why I share all of this is because representation on the buy side is something that's very important in this country. It helps people understand what they're buying, not just the house, but what are the schools? What are the laws that are happening? Are there things that are in effect the property value? Because if you buy an asset and it doesn't appreciate, that's a problem. And people are used yeah. to having their house do that. So all that's to say, the way the system operates because housing is so expensive is that the seller would offer Typically, it's not required. It's always been negotiable forever. And everybody- uh, I every think that that's the big revelation to the consumer, right? And that is to some degree, the basis of the case. I can tell you, I have sold a number of properties. I did not know it was negotiable. Honestly. Yeah. I mean, it. it is, it, every state has some different rules. So I'm going to generalize here because the contracts in each state will be slightly different. Typically in the listing agreement, there are always things that talk about compensation. I'm not, I'm going to generalize. Now, nobody reads anything. You don't read the privacy policy, the terms of use when you buy a product on Apple. So like, I don't buy the excuse that Americans are just like, well, I didn't know. Well, it's because none of us know anything that we sign because we sign stuff all the time. Fair. So in fairness, let's just go with the fact that it wasn't disclosed up front. Okay. Maybe that's an argument. 
But the reality is the way that this has worked, and it's worked this way for a very specific reason, is that when you have a represented buyer, when you have a represented seller, there is less legal problems that occur later because things were more clear and understood in advance. It's like why you wouldn't go to court and defend yourself. You hire a lawyer because you understand that there's a lot of complexity to it. They'll know the rules and processes. Okay. So, that's a different thing though. Now you're justifying it and I will get to that. I appreciate it. I am but just the simply... real question, question is James, will the industry change so that because could you argue that one of the reasons it's not very well disclosed by a seller's agent is because they want both sides and everybody wants dual agency, right? And if this goes away, will the seller's agents start to be more like, hey, you don't have to pay. You know, if we've got a, you know, will it be, will it change the rules of the game? Well, I think the outcome, we are swapping and you're changing the conversation, but I think the <laughs> outcome will be that uh, that essentially the seller will no longer collect compensation for the buyer's agent. So I want to make sure everybody understands this to answer your first question. So if let's yeah. just say I collected an amount, whatever that is from the seller, typically I'd split that amount and give it to the buyer's agent to help pay for the representation of the buyer to make a deal come Absolutely. together. That's going to end. I want to be very clear about it. That is done. And it's, it's not done yet through the courts, but it's done. Like it's going to end. The seller is going to be paid the seller is going to pay the seller's agent only. And in the future, the You're buyer's agent is going to get paid by the buyer or the seller directly. We'll come back to that in just a minute. To answer your other question, I do think you're going to see regulation put in place. I think you will see more. Okay, listen to what he said right there. He said, without a doubt, without a doubt, they're going to erase the, the fact that listing agents can offer the buyer agent a commission in MLS. Okay, that's... uh. And this guy's an insider. So this, this, this is, I take, I don't take this with a grain of salt, what he's saying here. Or clear disclosures up front, which has already happened in the Northwest MLS for sellers to understand that compensation is negotiable. You don't have to offer compensation to the buyer's agent, that all of these things are options. And certainly sellers agents will have to be better about articulating all of that. And to be clear, I am okay with that. Mm -hmm. I'm a hundred percent in favor of that because transparency is always good for the consumer. That being said, I don't think that it is a smart move for sellers to just go down the road of, well, I'm no longer doing it. It, it, it is, I have talked to insurance carriers about this, so yeah. I have a lot of data. Um, when you have unrepresented clients, your chances of ending up into legal liability goes 100%. up significantly. And you know what else somebody brought up to me that I was talking to a few minutes ago before this was safety. You know, I mean, so <laughs> they made the comment verbatim, nobody's coming into my house without a licensed real estate agent yeah. representation. And it's interesting because there was a company, I can't remember their name a few years ago, and I don't know if they're still around and they might be, but they were offering a service where you would do a background check of anybody coming into an open house. Yeah. Um, and we see that already, right? It's more like you see more scheduling times. So yeah. I do think that that's part of this. I think for it's sure. part of it. It may not yeah. be the primary, but there's certainly well, the advantage of knowing that this person has been vetted by the agent. So, 100%. Um, you know, you are letting them into your house when you're not there. Like there's, there's, there's things totally. with that. All of this stuff adds up into it. To what degree, and we'll debate this in a minute, is, is arguable. But I think that it's important to remember that the reason why you were doing this is because this is the key point. The buyer is going to spend every dollar they have to be able to afford your house because your house has gone up massively in price. It is very expensive to get financing today at 8% interest rates. The buyer is strapped for cash. And so to have the buyer have to choose of whether I want to have representation or not because I can't afford it anymore is the debate that we're going to have significantly. 100%. And I think if, if I, and I'm in this, not from a biased perspective, I've bought and sold houses, I own many, um, I will use, an agent locally, even so do I. I, could, I could do it on my own because I don't know the rules and laws and stuff of this particular area. And, you, yep. 100%. And, and that, and that's a, just that right. There's a point I want to really bring to light as well. And I've talked about this, me being a, a professional agent here in my area, I've done over a thousand deals here, commercial, single family condos, land, everything. I know this place, like the back of my hand for me to buy something here, local, do it with a breeze. For me to do something in Miami, 
or anywhere else, I'm not going to feel as comfortable. And this is coming from somebody who has 21 years experience as an agent helping people buy and sell real estate, who has a full, fully matured career doing this. I wouldn't feel comfortable buying something in Atlanta without having someone to consult with through the process that has my best interest in mind. I want a fiduciary and I'm willing to pay for that. Um, so I think that that's a very good point. E even even professionals, right? Like James said, he would he uses an agent. So I can't even imagine what goes on in the mind of a consumer when they go to buy or sell a home uh, with no experience, even if it's in their local market. I mean, you don't do this every day. Um, you know, think about that for a second. So, you know, I gave you that analogy on lending, mm -hmm. 100%. And I gave you this analogy when we talked yesterday, which was I was a loan officer when um, automated lending first came in years and years ago. And everybody said it's the death of the loan officer. You can get it through lending tree. Nobody's yeah. going to pay a loan officer Wasn't. anymore. Didn't happen. No. Um, it didn't. Um, mind you, probably less, much like this industry, you paid less. Um, it's more competitive. There's more fees. Um, but in truth, as I always say, and I don't mind being accountable to this, as long as people need, having done 10 years of being this person, um, as long as somebody need, people need somebody to blame uh, or to hold their hands, I think it's blame. Uh, but, you know, then they're, to your point, it's the largest transaction and they're always going to use yeah, it. Yeah, but I'll, also remember, it, you know, you're, you're buying, to your comment, to blame, I'll take that a step further, you know, when you're working with, a, a real estate agent you're also you've got errors and emissions policies there so like yeah. there's there okay. are things in place that if something went wrong there's an ability for some of these things to be managed i i exactly. i worry significantly in a world where and you can look at this in australia or other countries in fact i did yeah, a I great interview that. with damien ailes the new ceo of realtor.com on my podcast and he was in from australia and he was like it was terrifying to buy a house where they do it in auction on the front lawn of a property, by the way. And we're always, the, the lawyers are comparing us to other countries. I'm like, you're stupid. Like the countries don't opt. This is the best possible model developed in the world currently today. Does it need to be refined? Sure. But I would hate to be a buyer sitting on a front lawn with 40 other people trying to <laughs> auction on a property where you don't know what questions to ask. I mean, come on. So there, there's, their change needs to happen. Uh, we'll talk about that because some of my comments are controversial, but I see a light at the end of this tunnel that isn't as bad as most. Um, but I do think that consumers need to understand that it is smart to have a buyer represented. It is smart to have somebody who understands the process and can explain it to them. It is smart to have an agent help you understand what to disclose and what's going to happen. Uh, will the model shift? Potentially. We'll debate that, I'm sure, in a minute. But the, the models designed to limit liability, to have clarity, transparency, and have somebody understand what they purchased. Because by the way, I'll, I'll make this last comment and then I'll get off my soapbox. Dual agency is the worst idea possible. I'm very vocal about it. The same agent representing both sides of the transaction, by the way, confirms- Which is really where this whole thing started, let's face it. To ways. some degree. And that's certainly where the DOJ will go next. But by the way, I talked to my insurance provider at Desert ENO. So the number one claim that happens, the number one majority of claims for errors and emissions policy is dual agency. It's when the agent represented both sides and right. someone felt they got screwed and then voila, ends up in court. And wait until there's unrepresented buyers. Right now, the number one reason is dual agency. Wait till there's unrepresented buyers <laughs> and we'll see if that holds firm. So- you know, well, let's um, let me let me cut in here. First of all, we have a raised hand. We are not taking questions until the end. And frankly, only if we have time, because I know this is a big old can of worms. So if you have any questions, I will try and get to them. Please type them into the chat. We um, I appreciate it. I will be trying to read questions and we'll try and leave time. OK, so um, the next thing I want to segue into is um, questions about, like, isn't this model of sort of this concierge service or moderating the fees on behalf of the consumer. Isn't it already out there, right? You and I talked about this yesterday. It's out there already, right? So can we talk about some of the models that exist today? Because I do think you're right. There is this misperception a little bit that suddenly 
Nobody stressed this. Nobody has a model that caters to this new paradigm, right? Yeah. Um, so can we talk about that for a second? Yeah. So let me let me first start to frame this up and then I'll and I'll do it fast. I know you want me to move through this quickly. So there's nothing that prohibits and it's unconstitutional and illegal. <laughs> okay. There's nothing that prohibits a buyer from instructing the buyer's agent in the purchase contract to put a stipulation in it that says the sellers to pay the buyer's agent's compensation, just for clarity. Now, there's gonna be some rules around each individual state and some things to work through. I'm generalizing my comments here because every state's a little different. But there's, in general, a buyer can say, hey, I, you know, I'm agreeing to pay you X and I want you to make sure that that the seller pays it as part of our the seller is now pay another thing that can happen the seller can offer a credit to the buyer and the buyer can then pay the buyer's agent mm -hmm. and then the buyer can also pay the buyer's agent and i will just add this final comment and then i'll talk about models is that you will see a day coming very soon i promise you this is going to happen where there'll be changes in LTV and we're working through Fannie and Freddie and NER is doing a lot of this stuff now where the buyer will have the opportunity to finance compensation or any variation of. It could be that the, the buyer goes, I'm only going to pay whatever and the seller needs to pay the other portion. This becomes a negotiation between the buyer's agent, the buyer and the seller. And yeah, the seller's like the agent. Home inspection, it's exactly. Like fixes. Yeah. By the way, this is how it's done in commercial real estate. This isn't anything new. So everyone needs to just like calm down. Like there is plenty of ways that this can be done. <laughs> now let me go the other way. So everyone's saying that, oh, this is the end of buyer's agency. No, relax. Americans don't wake up and be like, hey, I want to go buy a house and let's just go do it all on our own. No one does that. That doesn't happen. We have a, it's a great stat I love to remind people of. 1960 dual income households was 30%. Now it's between 60 and 70%. The point is mom and dad are both working. If you've got kids, I do. Like we're just trying to figure out how to get through our day. We pay for convenience. In fact, a great example of this was Open Door. Consumers were willing to pay premium in compensation. They charged between seven to 10% at the time as a, as a compensation. And you take a haircut on selling the house all for close in seven days, all cash. The point is Americans are willing to pay for premium service. The debate goes, buyer's agency goes away. No, that's just stupid. That's not going to happen. Buyer's agents are just not going to go away. They're going to change the way they do things. And then there's essentially three models that everyone's talking about. The first is, well, maybe it'll go hourly, like a lawyer. Okay, well, let me break that down as to why that won't work. If you read the IRS statute for your independent contractor status, it's literally on NER's website. You cannot charge hourly. Just to be clear, it's item B of the statute. Go read it. Just look it up on NER's website. So you can't charge hourly if you want to remain an independent contractor, which means you either need to become a W-2, an employee under the brokerage. I promise you that is not happening. <laughs> Brokers are not going to go employ all their agents. Redfin. Oh, all some doing, have, some have. I mean, we're talking less than a percent of all brokerages <laughs> have people as employees. <laughs> Um, and look, and I mean this, but you're acting like it's never been done and it has, it, you it know? has, it is a very difficult model to run. It is usually teams that are very efficient in what they do with a pipeline to handle that. And the best example of that model not working so far is Redfin. And I mean that in the most respectful way possible, but they are moving away from hourly, literally now in traditional base. Not it's touching that one. <laughs> you can read the headlines. I'm just stating the facts. So yeah. Um, they're testing traditional based agents now in a couple markets in, on, on the West Coast. So all that being said, I don't think that's the answer. The big one probably is, do buyer's agents charge a flat rate? Whatever, I'm making up a number here. $3,995 for all, whatever, okay? Uh, um, and or is it a menu of services? These models aren't new. These I want to, I'm sure someone's listening that does this. I'm not saying they don't have a place. Factually speaking, it is a very small percentage of the market and has been for a very long time. Most of the big companies that have come in to try those models, I'll name three, just as an example. Uh, Foxton's, for those of you who've been in the industry as long as I have, go way back. Purple Bricks, uh, Rex, 
all three of those companies had massive funding. All three of them filed bankruptcy, no longer exist in the U.S. market. So it, it's a it's a question that is debatable, and maybe somebody will have the new secret code for it, and maybe the pressure on comp pushes that. But I was going to say sometimes it's timing. Sometimes te- sometimes agreed, models but- come into play. Because there's no need, like you think sometimes in business, something comes into the industry that you think you're going to redo the industry, but the market is not there. Sometimes the market comes back and and dictates. And I do think it's a question of whether or not that's where we are today. I'm not questioning that these things won't pop up. Maybe they gain market market share this time because buyers are going to question. We don't know. Yeah. Um, the third one is menu of services. And again, not a new business model. So menu, you pay for specific things. These actually... This, the irony of this is the two companies that were the biggest in this and actually were bigger and then have simply decreased in size over time was help you sell and assist to sell. They're a fraction of what they were. And I mean that in non-disrespectful to anybody listening, but they were a lot bigger and, and Americans had chosen to go down a different route for a long time. So these companies barely exist today. So I, I think it maybe the market shifts that. I, I don't think hourly is a realistic thing. I think that's just not where we are. If you have comp pressure, just let's go down this path, Audrey, and say that there is pressure on compensation on the buy side agent. Well, the last thing a broker is going to do is take on more expense with a decreasing pool of revenue. <laughs> so I think if anything, those other two models might gain some some traction. Um, well, I look, I think the reality of it is, and, and one of the comments we have in is, I think what we're saying, just to sum up, and then I want to kind of go and talk, circle back to what the industry is doing, mm-hmm. um, is it's pretty clear, number one, that we're going to have, um, you know, some slough off of agents, right? That that as consumers- 20 to 40%. Figure, that's, you're predicting 20, 40%. I'll leave it with you. I don't have a prediction. 20 to 40% less agents. What do you think about that? So 20 to 40%, what is that? Let's say there's 2 million agents out there. You know, there's like 1.4 something with NAR. And then there's another, how many ever that aren't a part of the National Association of Realtors. So let's say 2 million. All right. So 20% would be 400,000. He said 20 to 40. What did he say? Let's see what he said. I think what we're saying, just to sum up, and then I want to kind of go and talk, circle back to what the industry is doing, mm-hmm. um, is it's pretty clear, number one, that we're going to have, um, you know, some slough off of agents, right? That that as consumers- 20 to 40%. Figure, 20 to 40%. So that's 400 to 800,000. I mean, it's close to half. 40% is close to half. It's almost 50. So think about that for a second. And this guy said it real fast with- an incredible amount of confidence. Now, I've been talking about this, you know, for a couple of weeks now. Um, I feel like the future of this is less agents, more market share per agent. The ones that are left are good agents, higher quality agents. Um, and we have a different way that we do business. Maybe the buyers ask for the buyer agent fee to be paid in the contract. Um you know, th- there's a lot of uncertainty about exactly how we're going to operate, but there's going to be a new way that we operate. I think that's clear. Um, James here thinks that there won't be any buyer agent commission offered in MLS. And I do agree that there's going to be fewer agents in the industry. Let's get it. That's you're predicting 20, 40 percent. I'll leave it with you. I don't have a prediction, but there's no question that I agree that there'll be some percentage of agents who are in the industry. We all know the 80, 20 rule that will not be in the industry anymore because they're just not going to get paid period. And it's not going to be worth their time to do one or two transactions a month or, you know, 10 a year. Okay. And, and brokerages to some degree uh, will probably not be all that sad about that because they make the majority of their income from high producing agents. Right. Although they make money on actually, ancillary, ancillary services, services, actually, wait, I, no, yeah. you would know this better than me. So you no, go ahead and jump brokerages in. Brokerages don't make a majority of their money off the highest producers, unfortunately. Usually, well, they, because of the splits, is that, yeah. or yeah. however their comp is, but usually the highest producers have the best deal and it attracts all of the right. mid level producers. Brokerages make most of their money off the middle of the market, not the top. Fair enough. Okay. Fair enough. I maybe, and where I was going though, and please tell me if you think I'm wrong, is that they won't be necessarily crying a river over these, over the low, sort of low transaction producers. I mean, it depends upon the model. So right. the answer sometimes to that they would, make a lot of money off training those people and to selling be clear them what, what we yeah. call in the industry body shops, Yeah, um, right. companies that make money off of just like a monthly fee per agent and, yeah. or 
you know, per transaction, depending upon how they're structured, they'll see some of that pain. Look, everyone's going to feel some pain from this. There's no way around it. So yeah. you'll see if we lost 20 and I'll give you a couple stats. I think that are important. So in 2010, we had about 1.4 million realtors. I'm sorry, 2008, about 1.4 million realtors. By 2010, 11, we were down to 1 million. Now that was market conditions that caused 400,000 realtors to go away. My 20 to 40% number will be fairly accurate if the market continues at the way it is and the industry doesn't figure out how to articulate its value better. Then mm -hmm. you'll see a number between 20 to 40%. But you'll see this, by the way, by December with MLS dues and everything else. We've already lost some between 50 to 60,000 agents already. That number is only going to go up. I, that, to be clear, is not related to these suits yet. That's just... There's not enough deals going on in the United States. It's That's true this too, level actually. Of Asian and, one, and, so. and probably they'll attribute it to the suits, but in truth, the market is just- has nothing traffic. to do with it yet. The suits right. aren't having any impact. Okay. So. so number one, we know we're probably going to see less agents. We know there's going to be a variety of models, including buyer agency, which will hold to which will hold true. So you're going to see, let's face it, a choice for consumers on how to address this issue, period. There's just no two ways about it. There always it, right? was, and, but you'll see more of it, sure. Okay, people will become educated as to their choices. We'll leave it with that. How's sure. that? Um, and then I think, how does the industry deal with this? Let's circle back. I did the consumers. Now let's talk about the industry. We have a lot of industry people on the call. You know, um, how does the industry deal with this? How do MLSs, brokers, you know, there's a lot of talk. I mean, it, what do you see as the ramifications for the industry? So I will just simply state that you asked the question, why me earlier is I am talking to extremely important sources that most people don't have access to. I'm not going to name them, but we'll just leave it at that. So I think it's extremely important for everyone to understand a few things here. Um, this was the smaller of the cases <laughs> hmm. um, that we just lost. And and then this is, and I'm going to lay out the ramifications. There's a little detail here, but it's yeah, important yeah, yeah. to hear all this. So, yeah. so what has to happen now is we're waiting for the judge to decide essentially what the total damages are. Um, he'll make that ruling at some point here very shortly. Um, the plaintiffs will potentially file in for injunctive relief. I have heard from multiple sources that the actually before he gets going on that, we won't hear about this injunction um, very soon. It's actually going to be uh, April or May, possibly April or May, if the timeline works out the way that the courts have said. Department of Justice is working with the plaintiffs on that draft. Um, I've heard they were Back filing this week and I've heard here. potentially filing for injunctive relief. I There's a little detail here, but it's yeah, important yeah, yeah. to hear all this. So. Yeah. So what has to happen now is we're waiting for the judge to decide essentially what the total damages are. Um, he'll make that ruling at some point here very shortly. Um, the plaintiffs will potentially file in for injunctive relief. I have heard from multiple sources that the Department of Justice is working with the plaintiffs on that draft. Um, I've heard they were filing this week, then I've heard they're not. So just there's a lot of back and forth. That injunctive relief will likely include, if they do it, um, a outright request on ban of compensation in the MLS. I want to be very clear about my statement here. This is coming. It doesn't matter whether it's through this case or whether it's through another or whether the DOJ does it or whether this wild card of the Federal Trade Commission, which nobody's paying any attention to, um, comes in and rewrite the rules. A day is coming very quickly here where compensation is no longer shared through the multiple listing service. We'll talk about that in a minute. So what we're waiting for right now, the sort of the next piece of this is what what is the plaintiffs going to do next with their injunctive relief if they do? And also, uh, what is the judge to decide on the amount? Then you're hearing NER talk about appealing and obviously the other defendants appealing as well. Um, look, the, the problem here is I, I can't speak for them, but I've seen the numbers. I've looked at the finances. None of these companies can afford these kinds of damages. So in order to appeal, they'd have to post a bond. They have to basically get somebody to guarantee through assets these damage amounts in order to appeal because what they don't want to do, the judge doesn't want to do is have the defendant spend all of their money and then plaintiffs get nothing. Sure. So this is the process that it goes through. Um, I'm simplifying. There's more, more to it. No, this is good. Challenges. This is good. So... What ends up happening is if, if any are appeals, that appeal is this comment you've been saying, it'll take years to play out, well, sort of. <laughs> um, maybe if we appeal, we can appeal the damages portion and that will take years potentially, could take a long time to go through that and make all the way up to the Supreme Court in theory. The problem here 
is, and this is now where I'm going to get a little bit deeper into this, is the plaintiffs have already filed another class action suit, and not just now in Missouri, but they've named seven other top brokerages across the U.S. in all 50 states. What's very interesting about this is they filed a class in all 50 states. That opens up the class. So now it's the whole nation. They're claiming damages of 200 to $600 billion potentially. Um, don't freak out. These numbers are really stupid. I'll explain why in a minute. Um, but also strategically, what's interesting is the class has been opened up nationally. So there could be a way to settle this nationally. I'll come back to that. So it's an okay. advantage, actually. Well, it's well, it's a disadvantage and advantage depending on how you're looking at it. So, yeah. the, but the, they've signaled. Look, the plaintiffs have signaled that they want to settle. They already did it with Remax and Anywhere for fifty percent, basically, of their free cash. So, what's also interesting about this is the way this works is there's these three different uh, class action suits. All the lawyers for those three different suits, got in the same room and negotiated a, what I'm going to call global sell settlement with uh, Remax and Anywhere. So they all agreed to share in the pot of money that was given to them at every single person who's been following this has been saying that like, it's going to be billions of dollars. And, and candidly, I've been saying, well, that doesn't make any sense. They don't, don't have that money. So you can't settle for something you don't have. So the numbers came in lower. file suits bankrupt companies they want to make money um yeah, and and i want to give a historical perspective here the largest class action suit in this country that's ever been filed was against the tobacco industry and it was for 206 billion dollars now the tobacco industry has a lot more money than the real estate industry like a lot did at the time so you know when we hear 200 200 to 600 billion dollars of the damages it's just nonsense that that's just a number it doesn't mean anything so even in this particular case where you've got you know, let's say it's 5.3 billion. Let's say the judge gives treble damages and goes for the full amount. It, it, the industry doesn't have it. So the choices are we can negotiate a settlement for what we can afford to do to live another day, or we'll just file chapter 11 and peace out. You're on your own. So that the plaintiff doesn't want that. And neither does the judge because the judge wants to find a middle road for the plaintiff. Well, if they declare bankruptcy, the plaintiffs aren't going to get anything. And that's what that we all know there are many mainstream yeah. cases of that. So, so my point here, and I'll move this along is you need no, to, sorry. everyone needs to chill out on these numbers. They're just posturing. Okay. We have to find a balance through it. Now, the way this is going to go is compensation will end in the M. Less. I think you're going to see a lot of rules that were, well, were outlined. I think they're important for people to understand. These are the things that you should be expecting to happen. So number one, anybody who requires membership in the National Association of Realtors will need to be, if you haven't already changed your rules, so that it is an optional thing for agents to choose to do. That is a requirement in the current settlements of REMAX. Are you talking about brokers? You're talking about brokerages, mm -hmm. not requiring to be part of the... Correct. Yeah, this will be a requirement for them to not to not require any R. And that also means the code of ethics, which I want to make a comment, which shows how stupid the plaintiff's lawyers are, because remove the code of ethics Wait, is it a benchmark. Hurts. It only hurts <laughs> consumers, <laughs> like you idiot. So yeah. I would love to say that, by the way, publicly. Um, so you can't or follow the code of ethics, which is that's just harmful to consumers. Um, no requirement to make or accept offers. You have to disclose to homeowners, as we talked about, compensation, what it is, that it's optional. It's negotiable that you don't have to offer compensation to the buyer's agent. You will sign it. They will sign a disclosure with very clear. It's going to be like RESPA. It's going to be like RESPA. Yeah. And I think that you used an example earlier. I think that's important is to re remember how the finance industry was changed after Dodd-Frank. And so yeah. if you go back, there was a lot of disclosures to help consumers understand what they were signing in the loan process. It didn't yeah. get rid of loan officers. No. I still use loan officers. Like, just there's just more disclosure and again i don't think that's a bad thing you can't say that your services are free if you're a buyer's agent you can't filter comp in the mls which is a no-brainer that shouldn't be there anyway um you have to advise all of the agents that they have to show properties regardless of comp uh you know all of these sort of things are going to be a standard process that'll be that everyone needs to plan for right now i'll stop there and i got a few more but i want to ask any questions audrey before i continue um, we do have questions coming in, but I, I'd rather you finish and then maybe okay. we'll, uh, we'll, you know, um, we'll go to a, what will a happen question. next. Here's yeah. the plan that's going to occur next. So right now, 12 states require buyer broker representation agreements 
at the very latest before an offer is submitted. That's already state law in 12 states. I think you will see all states move to this because it protects the buyer. Mm -hmm. It establishes fiduciary. You made a comment earlier. It gets rid of looky lose going through a seller's property that aren't interested in actually buying a house. There are advantages. Yeah, open houses board. may just go away completely. <laughs> I mean, or you're represented and you've, you've signed an agreement with somebody sure, at the minimum. Right. So that's that's the first thing. The second thing is I tell every every agent, including you know almost the 6,000 in my company, uh, you need to treat every buyer like a seller. You sit down, you explain to them what you do, you articulate your value, yeah. you you talk about the process, the complexities of buying a house. You need to learn to tell to talk about your services and then have an agreement in place, what they're gonna pay you, and then explain to them this process. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Um, that is, you know, I, I do try and make this masterclass not an infomercial but I will uh, submit my little um, earn my salary plug here for local logic, which is that we are moving heavily into products, um, including our location assessment report that do nothing but support um, and are out there to help support the, the buyer's agent and the seller's agent, but yeah. specifically really the buyer's agent in terms of understanding what expertise they bring to the market. So if you want to learn more about that, find me, that's my plug, but I do think we're ahead of it as well and understand that that's where the market is going. And in truth, I do think to your point, the industry, look, I've been in the industry, my whole family's in real estate. I use an agent. I mean, I always think if nobody's going to use an agent, it's probably going to be you or me, right? We're definitely going to think we know better. And I have, oh, I have a phenomenal agent. So I, and it's been incredibly worthwhile every time. So I think, yeah, you're right. The onus is on how do we make sure. So really one person said, what's the future? Or the future really is that the industry has to be a little more equitable. The industry has to be more careful about articulating the value. There will be some new models. Some people will take advantage of those models, but those models will still include compensation in one form. In some um, type of form. Yes. Yeah, exactly. And um, by the way, that doesn't mean that there won't be people that don't want to use an agent. They're, they could already do that today. Currently in the market right now, roughly eight to 10% of buyers are for sale by owners. They don't, I'm sorry, are, are, are unrepresented in the yeah. process. Remember that half of those are people that are buying a neighbor's house or someone from the family. So like it's-, it's Well, a that, that's an interesting question though. So let me ask you a question before I turn it over to our questions, which is, will this, and this was in my head yesterday, will this, in, will this increase pocket listings? Will this, I mean, it's already a trend, right? I mean, the last sort of ripple of the industry was a few years ago with, you know, outlying pocket listings. So do you think it will affect that? Well, this, this is, is my, a really great question. This is my curveball. It, well, it's not a curveball. It's actually a fantastic question. There's um, a lot of debate right now on whether the Department of Justice wants the clear cooperation policy rescinded. So the, the, the requirement of if you take a listing that you put it in the MLS, thereby marketing it to the greatest exposure possible, which is the world. The reason why that was enacted was agents were telling sellers, I have my own buyers. I'll list it. And then I'll bring my own buyer to it. And then essentially I'll cut my comp and we'll do an right. off-market deal. It has been proven statistically. This is a fact that when you do deals like that, the general market will give you about a 15% lift on price than if you do it off-market. That is a literally statistical fact proven over and over and over again. So CCP was put in place to stop that because we wanted the seller to understand that putting it in the MLS getting it out on Zillow and all of these other portals and Realtor and all the rest of them, including the agent, et cetera, and, and making all agents aware of this property in the MLS will get you the highest price possible. So the big question is, the, and the Department of Justice has been investigating this policy, the question is, do they want to rescind it? I would argue that's actually going to harm sellers if you rescind that policy. I think there's a lot of implementation issues with CCP. I've been vocal about that, but I think the rule itself is designed to protect consumers. The reason why it's an issue with the Department of Justice is because of this requirement of offering compensation to the buyer's agent. And if you have to, if you if you take a listing and you're required to put it in the MLS, thereby guaranteeing right, 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 right. that's the issue. But if that's gone, which I believe yeah. will happen, then in my opinion, clear cooperation policy is a great rule because it's not requiring compensation, but you're protecting the seller. There's a very big debate going on. I know both at the federal agencies as well as in the industry about how that plays out. Um, I do think the biggest target next, this will be the big thing the DOJ goes after is dual agency. I do yeah. think they wanna see it go away. 
I, I'm again, I'm vocal. I also agree. I think it's not good for consumers only in very, ex ah, I figured out a plug only in the case of like, if you're Taylor Swift and you want to sell a house and not put it out on the open market, that was a joke earlier. Um, so to me, Two points for you. <laughs> there is a, there is a, there is a time and place for it, but it's very small case use case. Um, yeah, and I'm not even sure you're. I know you were. You're. We were dying to like throw in Swifty, but I don't even sure that 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 applies. Let me ask. We have 15 minutes left. Um, let me kind of throw in some questions. One of the questions I have is I'm just going to read it off because I don't. I don't know if I could do a good job of of uh, synergizing it. Uh, thoughts of how this impacts referral sources on the buy side. Even in states that require disclosure of referral fees, most times it was uh, that was paid via the seller through buyer agent comp. If buyers have to bring more money to closing to pay their agent and a referral fee is disclosed or shown in the settlement statement, the buyers may have a problem with that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next question. No, I, I think, look, look, I, 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 I want to, I'm being a little bit of a smart ass. Um, there are going to be a lot of, things that have to be worked out in this new world. Um, you know, for example, when we talk about uh, financing, you can't, you can't do it with VA currently at all. Like you can't have that done through a VA loan. Um, you know, we've got a 3% cap on conventional. There's a lot of things that are gonna have to be worked out yeah. both at the state levels from a disclosure perspective. I'm not downplaying the fact that there's a lot of things we're gonna have to maneuver as an industry. I just don't think these are insurmountable. Um, things like this, how we disclose stuff and whether it becomes an issue. Yeah. And I, I, I go back to this comment that we're going to have to learn how to articulate value very clearly to a, a buyer and they are going to choose whether they want to pay you whatever you're asking or not. And it becomes a negotiation. And then, you know, you're going to have to figure out how to get the seller to put some in or get them to finance or discount. I, I don't know. We're going to, this is going to be the game that's going to be played next. Uh, um, I think, as I've been very clear about, I think very good agents will not have a problem commanding what they want to be paid. I well, just... Yeah, I just, and, and uh, we look forward to giving them the tools to do it. And there'll be other yeah. companies that give yeah. them the tools to do it, not just us. Um, another question um was on batten one and batten two class what are my one. thoughts on them yeah i think so well we kind of covered this a little bit earlier okay. so the national class that's been opened up in this this recent case is a it, it basically opens up the amount of damages so I remember see. it's a four-year statute of limitations on these cases so it's anybody who sold a house within that four-year time frame could join the class. Well, technically everybody's entered into the class. You actually remove yourself from a class. But, uh, you know, the thing to, to keep in mind, Sylvia, um, I think that's actually one of my people, um, okay. is the numbers that they're talking about or it. Because if, they, let's just okay. say that they got $200 billion, where is anyone... <laughs> Where is anyone in the real estate industry going to come up with that money in the worst yeah. real estate market in the history of real estate right now? The yeah. only options are the plaintiffs can get some type of number that the defendants can afford to pay, or the other options we talked about is we just go bankrupt. And I, okay. I, I truly, I, I would say that that is a very, not saying this because I'm in the industry, it would be a very bad thing for consumers in a very complicated world and a very litigious transaction to not have representation and how all that works out. So all right now I understand the question and I do think you probably answered it before when it got asked, but let me ask another one then. Um, how can we make being a member of NAR optional when our local MLS is board owned and requires we be members before we can make a be a member of the MLS? Your MLS has the ability to change that is the answer. <laughs> Okay, well, it's thanks. never been to be clear. It has never been NAR's policies. That is a local policy that's decided down at your local level. It always has been for a long, long time. So, okay, remember, well, listen to that. She, he, she, he's saying that you don't, that the, the reason you have to be a part of NAR to have access to your MLS is not NAR's decision or NAR's rule, it's your local board's rule. Now, isn't that interesting? Do you, the do you think the MLS as well? 
I do. I think there's going to see a lot of changes. I didn't really cover that. I think you're going to see a lot of changes around the, there's going to be a lot of discussion about whether NAR governs MLSs. I really caution people from moving away from that because if you think about it this way, right now we have a uniform set of policies that apply across the majority of MLSs across the US. If all of a sudden every MLS is different, it could be a wild, wild west to some degree. You know, one MLS has one policy that borders another and then it's completely different. You, you know, well, that's happened before, and I'm not it, sure. Well, it was this truth. way before. Yeah, I was right, this exactly. way before, and I've been in this industry my entire life. I'm third gen. I've seen the days, I can yeah. actually speak to this, where there was no MLS, where it was a book. Wait and a minute. Wait a minute. You just gave me the time to say my perfect sound effect. Okay. Brrr, brrr, right? That's the dot matrix printer. I was just explaining the history of the MLS to somebody the other day. The I remember was, when it was. was Boris. It was a DOS-based system for those yes. of you who know what that means. So my point is these things, there are a lot of policies in place to protect consumers. We have to make sure we understand that. It's also to protect the industry as well. That doesn't mean there's these policies don't need change or modification, but I do worry about a world where everything is uncoupled to the, what I'm referring to is not comp, just how it's attached to NAR, how it's governed, what those policies are, it can be a very significant problem. And the best example I can give you where I live here in the Bay Area, we I, I literally border three multiple listing services. And if you if you lived in my area, you would have to join a few years ago, you'd have to join all three MLSs. Yeah, yeah. So if if they if there wasn't a unified feed, which there is now, and everybody did their own thing again, it actually just makes no a mess data of sharing. Everything. Yeah, it's right. a mess. So there's a lot of these rules that need to be thought about. But the answer is I do think if you're going to see consolidation amongst agents, which you will, uh, and certainly pressure on compensation on the buy side, which you will, um, I think that it's you're going to see some. You're going to have to see consolidation amongst MLSs and associations as well. That's going to happen. Well, and that's already happening. Let me um, let me bring up a couple other things that um, <laughs> I I really am very fond of John who joins. Um, but look, the question here isn't the NAR policy that if the broker is a member, then the agents need to be. Can the broker allow agents to decide? Well, I think to my comment earlier, which is important, all of that is going to be optional now. Okay. That's already part of, that's to be clear, this is already part of the settlement for the franchisors with the Remax and Anywhere settlement, that there's no requirement to join NAR. These are all going to be negotiations in, in all of this stuff on what those requirements are. I, it is very clear to me, again, I'm a spectator here. I'm not currently a defendant, God forbid. Um, but it's very clear to me that this lawyer and this firm wants to see, you know, NAR's structure and um, strength diminished significantly. And in their world, they want people to make a choice on whether they want to join NAR or not. Um, I, I will I will add one other comment to this. It is extraordinarily important for our industry to understand, despite all of NAR's issues, and there are many, which we don't need to get into on this podcast, the one thing that they're very good at is lobbying. This is a comment I think is extremely important for both buyers, sellers, and agents. What NAR does exceptionally well, despite all the headlines that you're reading, they are a protectionist company or organization for private property rights in this country. I cannot begin to tell you how many bills have been squashed by NAR, written by stupid politicians that have really bad ideas that would destroy equity, home ownership, et cetera. And that doesn't mean they get them all right, but I can tell you that without the organization's strength, we would look very differently in this country from private property rights, equity development, et cetera. So I, I caution sure. everyone as you are making these choices to what you want to do and everybody has to make their own choices talk to your own lawyer whatever i can tell you internally for me is that i'm continuing to emphasize that our people should be a member of that i'm not saying it's a requirement but certainly i will advocate that internally in our own organization so i think that's i, I think we can wrap it up there too because i really like that i do think it's important um i did not know until like about a year or so ago that NAR is actually the number one, and I live in Washington, D.C., so this is a powerful statement because I know who lives here. Now, NAR is the largest lobbying organization 
in the country. Right. And that includes over, let's just for perspective, that's more than healthcare, like all the, the big pharma, all the cars, the unions, you name it, it is number one. And it is not only because there are a million plus agents nationwide, it is because of all the things. And I think maybe it's interesting, maybe we end this on NAR needs to do a better job, right? Of articulating the value it brings to the industry too. So maybe it, my, my friend always says the fish, it, stink, it, it stinks from the head. So maybe if, uh, okay. if, if NAR, well, you know, who, I'll tell you later who said it, but the NAR maybe is where, is, is, has an increased responsibility, right? Not just a mention in a modern family episode of real tour versus, right? <laughs> I don't disagree with you. I've, I've been, and we'll, we'll end it here, but I've been very yeah. vocal about the fact that I think yeah. NAR needs to have a pretty significant change in its PR strategy. And this isn't a dig on anybody there. I know a lot of people there, but nobody yeah. really cares what the word realtor means. If you ask consumers, they don't care. Yeah. Um, not only do they not care, do they don't yeah. know. They don't know. And the, I think more than anything is it's we they do need to do a better job of articulating value. I think the issues in which they solve should be more front and center. But also, I'll say this, our industry needs to do a better job of educating itself, because yeah. I can't tell you how many people I've spoken to in the past like two weeks I didn't even know these lawsuits were happening. And I'm like, this is like you can't you can't be in a world of business where this has been going on for three years or longer and then just be aware of it. Like you need to educate yourself, too. Spend yeah. time researching what an organization does before you draw conclusions. Um, and then it's a fair debate. It's like, well, I, I don't like what they do this and this, but I'm, like I said, there's a lot of things I don't like that NER does. There's a lot of things I do like that they do. And I think that you have to, you have to separate those two and figure out sort of what you want to support and not. And, you know, we also have to be facing the fact that these changes are coming. Um, yeah. I do want to yeah. answer this one thing and we'll call it. I think it's very important to pay close attention over the next few months on these cases because I am very much out in the public saying I think a settlement is is the right approach for our industry um, and and getting ahead of it now and trying to figure out what this new world looks like and, and then get past this. Now, I don't know about you, but that was some incredible perspective for me. I really appreciated James's commentary and insight. If you know James Dwiggins, the CEO of Home uh, next home. If you're part of next home and you know him, please reach out and tell him I would love to have him on my show. I send my message on Instagram. Haven't heard anything back. Anyway, let me know your thoughts on all of this. Everything is still up in the air, but this gives us some real insight of a real insider. All right. Until next time. I